Go ahead and make your way with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. We had preached last Sunday evening on the subject of the covering. And throughout the course of the week, some things, the Lord had brought some things to my mind that I wanted to somewhat reiterate. And then also the, the main focus of the message for this evening, though, is objections answered with regards to the covering as it is set forth there in the Scriptures. Now, beloved, we as pastors, at, at times, we can be guilty or at least accused of riding our hobby horse. And, and I've seen this happen. No doubt I've been guilty of it at times that maybe it may be things such as abortion or, or homosexual marriage, so on and so forth. And sometimes pastors can seem like get a fire lit under them and that's all you'll hear preach for three months straight is, is all against the elections or, or gay marriage, so on and so forth. Uh, and we strive not to do that. And or sometimes they will use another adage of saying that we strum but one string of our guitar. Now the good news is that since I don't know how to play a guitar, that won't be an issue with me. Amen? That'll soak in a little bit. So at any rate, the Bible tells though, that, though there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now we had striven last week somewhat to point out the fact, beloved, that we live in a world where headship is something which is pretty well despised on so many different levels and in so many different respects. In other words, out in the world, and once again, uh, it is not within the scope of our message to unravel all of the problems with regards to those things, nor provide solutions for them. Uh, out in the world, though, we hear oftentimes women will dwell in a workplace where there's a glass ceiling, where women cannot do, do as well as men. I'm not saying it exists. I'm certainly not saying that it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is it's not the scope of this message to deal with those things. But it is, beloved, the scope of the message to show forth, as the Scripture says, that the head of every woman is the man. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, beloved, when we think about that phrase there, and the head of the woman is the man, there are some people today, beloved, that... If the message were to, to enter into the wrong circles, and I really could care less about that, but if the message were enter in, to enter into the wrong circles, they'd say that we are an archaic church, which holds to practices that hold women back, or so on and so forth. They, would take, they can say that I, I hate women, or I'm a, I'm, I'm a chauvinist, or a misogynist. Well, but that's not the case at all. All I'm doing is presenting to you the fact the Bible says, and the head of the woman is the man. For anyone, whether it's here, and I don't believe that there's a problem here in our assembly with that, but anyone who may listen into the broadcast and you be like, well, I don't like the sound of that. I don't like what the Bible says there. Well, may I encourage you to take it up with the Lord then. It's His Word. He's the one that said it. The Bible goes on to say there, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Once again, this is why whenever men come in, we, if we're wearing a hat, we will take our hats off, particularly in the assembly. They will still do that at ball games, at places where they will sing the national anthem. And beloved, I would submit to you that if we will remove our hat in order to honor the national anthem of the United States of America, certainly the Lord's church is even more so worthy of that. Now, the Bible goes on to say then, but every man... I'm sorry, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. I was once again praying early one morning. It was somewhat cold in our house, and as I was praying, I had a toboggan on. As you can tell, I didn't have much insulation up there, amen. But I had a toboggan on, and then as I entered into my time of prayer, I got to thinking, it, it seemed like the Lord put it on my heart. The thought came to my mind, am I dishonoring the Lord to pray with this toboggan on? Which again, this is not the scope of the message to ferret out all of those things. But I began to think, am I dishonoring the Lord to pray with this toboggan on, to pray with my head covered? Once again, I don't believe that that was in an assembly, certainly not a public assembly, not in my prayer closet. But then I began to contemplate and meditate with regards to all of the implications about 
dishonoring the Lord in our prayer time and exactly what it is and what would be entailed in dishonoring the Lord. And as the Bible says, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonor their head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. We have said also in the past, beloved, we will get into it here momentarily, that there was a problem of prostitutes back during these days. Pretty well throughout history, there's been a problem there with prostitutes, to be honest with you. In the Old Testament, there was problems with prostitutes. Still now in the New Testament, beloved, New Testament times in the city of Corinth, it was the same, and oftentimes those women would shave their heads for the sake of cleanliness. But the Bible goes on to say there in verse number 6, For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. And once again, we had pointed that out last week, that man was formed from the dust of the earth. When women were formed, the Bible teaches us that God had removed a, a rib from Adam, and it was from man that the woman was made. I appreciate one commentator who said that the, the woman was not taken from the, the shoulder of the man, that she would be over him, or from the head of the man, nor was she taken from his foot, that she would constantly be trampled down by men, but she was taken rather from the side of the man. The Bible says, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. We also mentioned this last week, beloved, that there are commentators. Many of them are now dead. I'm not talking about newfangled commentators or uh, whippersnappers, as sometimes we might call them. But I mean commentators of old who would take and say that this particular verse here, for this calls out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Many of them will just flat out say, I do not know how to interpret that. I, I don't understand what it means. They want to take and somewhat rearrange the original language in order to accommodate what they say that it means, but we must not do that. And as I'd said last week, I believe that it's with regards to the woman having power in prayer. Beloved, do not ever underestimate the power of the prayer life of a godly woman. Wake up. Do not ever underestimate the power in the prayer life of a godly woman. I'm not saying that they have more power than men, per se. But what I'm saying, beloved, is I know some of the saintliest people that I know of are godly women who will pour their hearts out before the Lord in prayer. And oftentimes we might think nothing of them. We might, we might not even realize that they're praying for us at all. But because they're somewhat behind the scenes, and never underestimate, beloved, that power that a woman has in prayer. Well, I believe that the point there is that if a woman will take, and as the Bible says, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels, if the woman will not pray with a covering on there, then I believe that she loses that power in prayer in the assembly. Now, maybe someone will say, well, Brother Spears, we don't have our ladies praying uh, publicly in the assembly. We don't call on women to pray. Why is it that we do that? Because the Bible gives to us prohibitions in two different places that are women to keep silence in the assembly. But, beloved, once again, I would encourage each of you that throughout the course of our services, this very moment, I stand in dire need of your prayers as the people of God. I'm not talking about my day tomorrow, but I'm talking about right this very minute that I would to the Lord, that every one of you, men and women alike, that you would be praying, Lord, use our pastor. Lord, give our pastor wisdom. Lord, remove any hindrance from our pastor. Lord, make the message clear. Lord, make the message plain. Lord, take and use the message in the hearts and lives of others and start in my heart. I stand in need of your intercessory prayer right this very moment. Right this moment. I cannot stand here and preach without it. Apart from the power of the Spirit of God resting upon the preacher, beloved, preachers, they can get up and talk for 30 minutes, an hour even, and they will accomplish absolutely nothing lest they have an unction from on high from the Spirit of God. I need your prayers. Well, as we enter into prayer this day, as we enter into our service this day, I trust that you have been and that you will be praying for the service because this is one of the ministries that each of you can be engaged in during the preaching of God's Word. The men can be saying amen, and the women can be praying that God will use the message. And I trust that that's what's taking place. 
Well, once again, as the Bible says, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in verse number 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doeth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now we will cover that objection here momentarily. In the last verse there, verse 16 says, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such customs, neither the churches of God. Now, having read the passage, beloved, the objections answered. The doctrine is set forth, and we have read that. And some of the objections were mentioned in passing last Sunday evening. Tonight, I would like to deal with them more so in detail. Now, once again, one of the things that we must ask before we can move on is why does it really matter? What difference does it really make if a woman dishonors the Lord or not? Beloved, I believe that the point there is obvious that it's not good for a woman or a man to dishonor the Lord. I would not dishonor any of you folks purposely by any stretch of the imagination. There's no way. I, I love each of you too much. I would not want to dishonor any of you. There's no one who I would dis want to dishonor. I wouldn't want to dishonor Brother Preston. I wouldn't want to dishonor Brother Tom, Brother Tanner, Brother Butch. There's no one. I wouldn't want to dishonor Brother Larry Anderson or Brother Bustle. I would never purposely want to dishonor any of you because that causes a division or a rift in our relationship to dishonor someone. If I were to take, I don't want to pick on any older men because you're older, but uh, if I were to take and pick on Silas when he's married and has a wife and children, and I would go around and say, I'll tell you what, that Silas, he's a pretty sorry father. You know what I'm doing? I'm dishonoring Silas. It's a sin for me to do that. I'm making accusations against him. It's not right for me to do that. Well, beloved, why does it matter then that we are right with regards to the woman's covering? It is because of that danger, beloved, of dishonoring your head as a woman, and it will result in that loss of power. But finally, objection number one. This is one of the things that people will sometimes raise, and I will also say at the, before we proceed on with the message this evening that it is not my intent nor to desire to argue or to debate with anyone whatsoever. Maybe someone on the Internet will say, well, that, that guy's wrong, and I'm going to message him, and I'm going to argue with him. Well, you can message all you want to, but I'm not here to argue nor to debate it. The Lord has given me this particular flock to watch over. It's not my responsibility to watch over the flock of another individual anywhere else in the world, but rather, beloved, I'm the shepherd of this particular flock, the under-shepherd, and this flock is my responsibility with regards to that. So it is not my desire to argue with anyone. But objection number one, sometimes people will say it is a cultural tradition meant only for those living in the city of Corinth. This is what I'd heard for many, many years, that the head covering the woman, that it is only a cultural tradition, and it's for the women living in the city of Corinth or at this particular point in time, and it has to do with their customs. In other words, this is what some people take and say. It is not for us today. It's only for those women living in the city of Corinth. And this is where the entire argument goes on into the fact that they will take and say many of the Corinthian women that they were prostitutes. And when the Lord would save them and then they would begin coming to church, then their heads were shaved because they were prostitutes up until recently. And that's why that they should put a covering on. In other words, they would take and say it's only for those women, or it is only a custom for those at that point in time. Now, in response to that, or a rebuttal to that, beloved, would be, we do not treat the doctrine of women acknowledging her husband's headship as a bygone doctrine. Now, let me explain that just a little bit. The Bible says there quite clearly in verse number three, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. We all amen to that. Amen. Amen. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. Amen. We ought to amen to that because that's the Bible. And the head of Christ is God. Once again, we say amen to that. Amen. Now, do we say then that that's only a cultural tradition, that the head of every man is Christ? Do we say that's only for those willing in the city of Corinth? No, we do not. 
Do we take and say, well, that's only in response to their particular day and age? No, we do not say that at all. With regards to the verses leading up to the passages on the covering, we do not simply say, well, that's simply a cultural tradition. By the same token, beloved, when we get on down to verse number 17, through the end of the chapter where the Bible deals with the Lord's Supper, do we take and say that that is only a cultural tradition? Do we take and say, well, the thing about it is, is that the covering is only a culture, and so is the rest of the chapter. Beloved, let me tell you folks something. We as Baptists, we will not, we, we do not relegate any of chapter 10 or the end of chapter number 11 as a custom or a tradition only to be observed back during their day. Now, most Baptists, we will fight and die and stand for 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 through 17 through verse 34. In other words, when it comes to closed communion, we will fight for that. When it comes to closed communion, if another church comes to us or another individual and they say, we want to take part in your communion service, once again, we will not tackle them or beat them up or ride them out of the building on a rail. But if an individual were to enter into our service and say, oh, this is really going to be great. You are observing the Lord's Supper this evening, and I haven't had the Lord's Supper for a while. I believe that I'm going to partake. I will take and tell that individual, the Lord's Supper is only for the members of the Lord's Church. It's not for visitors, not for people from other churches. It's only for the members of the Lord's Church. In other words, beloved, we do not say that that's only a custom for the Corinthians, but we still observe it and practice it just as it is set forth in the scriptures, and so it is with the covering as well, beloved. Now, once again, we have mentioned already numerous times with regards to the women of ill repute, to put it mildly or put it nicely, back in their day, and the problems that they had. But yet, beloved, the Bible does not say here that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, in the Bible, then, when it talks about the covering, the Bible does not mention prostitutes in any place whatsoever. It doesn't mention them. Now, would you not think that the Spirit of God would have taken and said, now these next few verses, they're for those who were at one time prostitutes, and they're now saved. We have some special instructions for you until your hair grows out. Would the Spirit of God have not made that plain? But in other words, beloved, if we come to that place that we begin to interject the subject or the idea of prostitutes, and that's the reason for that, are we not adding to the Word of God? Amen. We're putting something there that's not there. Objection number two, then. What sometimes people will take and say, and once again, the context there dealing with the fact that it is in no way, beloved, dealing with former prostitutes or how they should dress, and we must also acknowledge that. Now, a portion, beloved, of the work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us in to all truth. That's a portion of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells in the Gospel of John that when the Spirit has come, that he will guide us, that he will lead us into the truth. Well, would he have mentioned prostitutes if it had anything to do with it, just once. The answer, once again, is no. The next objection, then, would be that which most women wear in our day is too small to cover anything, so they should not wear them at all. Wake up. I've heard some people take and say, the, they, will, they will maybe take and say, well, you know what, that tiny little doily, the Bible is teaching here a covering, and that tiny little doily, what exactly does it cover? It doesn't cover anything at all. So therefore, because the head coverings are small in our day, they shouldn't even be worn. Well, beloved, we must realize when it comes to these things, if someone will take and say they are so small, so they should not wear them at all, the covering is a symbol, a sign, and a token which has been prescribed by God. Amen. Now think with me about this. The size and the dimensions, they are not given as they were with regards to the ark and the tabernacle. Do you remember back the instructions for the tabernacle, for the ark, so on and so forth? And boy, I'll tell you what, as you're reading through there, it's 14 cubits here and three cubits there and three this and three that there. And as you read through it, the Lord is extremely detailed in giving those dimensions. 
Well, when it comes to the covering, beloved, and primarily here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 is the place that deals with that in the scriptures. Now, once again, the Lord does not say that the head covering is to be 6 by 9 inches or 6 by 6 inches or 3 by 3 inches or, or 12 by 12 inches. Those instructions are not given in the word of God. Thus, beloved, I believe that when it comes to that being a token that the woman has that covering on to show her submission, I believe that if it were that important that it has to be a certain size or dimension, you see, beloved, I believe that the spear would have taken and said that it should be one cubit by one cubit, but rather it simply says covering. And because the word of God simply mentions a covering there, we're not going to take and say that the covering has to be from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot. We're not going to say that. To take, for me to get up and take and say, well, the covering, it has to cover from the head to the toes. The Bible does not say that. And for me to go beyond the word of God, beloved, then once again, I would be adding to the scriptures. The size, the dimensions, they're not given there. And once again, beloved, we would ask the question as well, if someone wants to take and say, well, women's head covering today, it's too small. Well, we have asked the question numerous times. One time a brother had somewhat attacked me over it. How long is too long for a man's hair? Or how short is too short for a woman's hair? The Bible does not say that a man's hair cannot be more than three inches or a woman's hair has to be uh, more than three inches or less. The Word of God does not tell us. It does not go into detail. I would point you folks to many of the old divines, such as John Gill, if you will. John Gill, some of the brethren back then, they would wear a shoulder-length wig down once again to their shoulders. That's why I said shoulder-length, amen? But at any rate, they would wear a shoulder-length wig, and I mean to tell you, it would come way down there. Well, we could look at them and they could say, well, that's, that's somewhat of a, a fake hair or something like that. If we were to let our hair grow out that long, you all would ride us out of town on a rail. That does indeed have to do with our custom. But back during those days, beloved, many of the old divine, the men would have longer hair, longer than we would prefer, but yet we did not count them to be ungodly. So the point then this evening is this, beloved. With regards to how long is too long for a man's hair, the Bible does not say... The Bible does not say how long is long enough for a woman's hair. The Bible does not say, but simply says long or short. Well, with regards to the covering, covering, I would submit to you that basically it is the same thing. By all means, though, if it is your conviction to anyone who will take and say, well, I believe women's head coverings are too small today. They need to be larger. Now, here's the peculiar thing about that. Sometimes when brethren will take and say that, the woman's head covering is too small today, that, that that little thing up there that it doesn't cover enough. If that is your conviction, now, now I want to be careful on this. The brethren who will take and say, that little, that little round thing, it's insufficient to be a covering, so I'm not going to have my wife wear anything at all. Really? That doesn't make much sense. But now, once again, having said that, if it is an individual's conviction that your wife's head covering should be down to the shoulders or down halfway down the back, I've seen ladies in the Philippines who will wear them halfway down the back. If that's your conviction, by all means, have at it. We would not condemn anyone for such a thing. If that's your conviction that it needs to be larger, have your wife wear one that is larger then. We would also ask by way of illustration this, beloved. Does the size of a wedding ring matter? Does it matter? I would like to ask who's a lady here with a small wedding ring, but that may be embarrassing, amen? The point is, beloved, is that if I were dirt poor and I took a piece of 14-gauge wire and I were to bend that wire around and hammer it out, or, or if I were to take a quarter and make my wife a wedding ring that cost me 25 cents and a little bit of sweat, and I were to slip that ring on this finger of her left hand, when she goes out in public and people see that, that ring, whether it's a quarter, whether it's a piece of wire, they see that ring on that finger, probably they're going to realize that that it's a token, it's a sign that she is in a committed relationship to the most wonderful, handsome husband in the world. Amen? Come on, brother. Brother Anders, you could help me out a little bit on that. But in other words, beloved, that wedding ring, it's a token. And whether it costs a million dollars, it doesn't make you any more married. You're still married. Or whether it costs 10 cents, 
It doesn't make you any less married. You know why that is? It's because it's a token. It is a sign. And by that sign, you're telling others, you're projecting to others, you're broadcasting, communicating to others that I'm in a relationship because I have this wedding band on my finger no matter how much it costs, whether much or little bit, whether it's wide or narrow, it is still that sign. Well, beloved, I believe that it is the same with a woman's covering. It doesn't necessarily have to be two feet by two feet. It doesn't necessarily have to be six inches by six inches because it is a sign. It's a way for the woman to take and say that I am in subjection. To the men, to the church, to my husband. Uh, the next objection then that I have heard is this. Sometimes, and I've heard people say this, sometimes I see women disrespecting their husbands while wearing the covering. So therefore they should remove it. People will take and say, that woman over there, she has that covering on. What's the covering? It's a sign. It's a token that she's living in submission to her husband. It's a sign that her husband is her head. But yet, if one church was over, she stuck her head in the door and she yelled out at her husband and she said, I'm ready to go. Why aren't you in the car now? So therefore, if she's going to treat her husband that way, she ought to take that covering off. Now, once again, my answer to that objection would be, I agree. I agree. In other words, if you're going to wear the covering as a symbol, as a sign, as a token that you're living in subjection to your husband, then you should indeed be doing just that and live in subjection to him. And yet, beloved, we must also say that this does not invalidate the teaching of the covering. In other words, if a woman is disrespectful to her husband, that doesn't mean all women everywhere should be disrespectful to their husbands. But rather, beloved, it does not invalidate the teaching. The next objection would be, and this is one that many people will hold to. Some of you may hold to it. But as the Bible says, notice back there in verse number 15 of the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 15, the Bible says there, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. So people may take and say, and this was my position for a number of years, years ago, that the long hair is the woman's covering. You don't need an additional covering because the woman's hair, the woman's long hair, is indeed her covering. Now with regards to that, beloved, my response to that would be that there are two different words. Back in verse number 6 where the Bible says, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. That word covered there, it is a different Greek word than the covering given there in verse number 15. There are two separate words in the Greek. And the thing about it is one of those coverings, the first covering, it can be taken on and off at will. In other words, you can remove it, you can put it back on. Whereas the hair, if you remove it, you're not going to be able to put it back on very easily. So it is two separate words for that term in the Greek. Two different words. Now, once again, with response to that, we would also ask the question, why would the Spirit of God spend all of these verses just to tell a woman... Wear your hair to church. Beloved, we serve a God who is more than intelligent. All wisdom, all knowledge dwells with him. And for him to take and say, wear your hair at the church, would that not be kind of a peculiar thing for the Lord to tell us? Just simply for a woman to wear her hair to church. So thus, we cannot take and say that it is just the hair. Finally, beloved, the other objection that we will answer this evening is sometimes people will then, they will move on down to verse number 16 where the Bible says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, sometimes people will take and say, well, the Bible even says that if you're contentious, if you don't agree with it, if you're argumentative about it, that then there's no such custom as the head covering, that we don't have to worry about it. Or if it will stir up strife, then just forget it. We have no such custom as the head covering. Beloved, to that, I would simply say, 
that oftentimes we need to observe the scriptures as they're given to us, as well as the fact that there is not another doctrine in all the scriptures that we take this approach with. Now think with me about this. If someone is going to get mad about the head covering and take say, well, I'll tell you what, I don't believe in, I don't appreciate it, I'm upset that you'd preach on it. And we take say, oh, well, okay, then, then there's no such thing as the head covering. Now let me ask you this. What if someone comes to us and they say, I don't believe in the virgin birth. I think it's an impossibility. It's never, ever, ever happened. And the Bible's only a made-up book of fairy tales. And it offends me that you would even say that the virgin birth is real. Do we take and say to that person, no, I'm sorry. It's my bad. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, then we will just do away with it. We will cease to proclaim it. We will no longer hold that doctrine because you're upset about it. Beloved, there is an individual, a more modern individual, do not agree with them on many things, uh, do not even know that they know the Lord is their Savior, but they have a rather astute saying that says, facts don't care about your feelings. Facts don't care about your feelings. Now, what we mean by that, beloved, is if someone wants to get mad about the virgin birth or if someone wants to get mad about church truth, we do not say to that individual, I'm sorry, you're upset. I didn't mean to upset you. But because you're upset, we will just pretend like church truth doesn't exist at all and we will never mention it again. We don't do that with regards to the virgin birth. We do not do that with regards to church truth. We do not do that with regards to any other doctrine. If someone were to take and say, but if any man seemed to be contentious, we have no such custom. The custom that he says we have no such custom, it is with regards to the contention within the Lord's churches. Amen. Now you see, beloved, once again, this brings us then closer to the closing. I say that carefully. The head covering is not something which is given by the Lord to cause bickering and arguing within the church. It's not something which is given to cause bickering and arguing between churches. It is not given as something, as a matter of pride, that a woman may be able to take and say, you know what, I have my covering on and I'm very close to the Lord, whereas you're, you're very distant from the Lord because you're not. Beloved, if that would ever be the thought, then it is a sinful thought. It's not right. Now, I will recount the story that I'd given you all last week. And the reason that I do so, beloved, is because it very well may arise in the future once again. And I want those of you who are still here, maybe the Lord will call me home, whatever the case may be in the future. Uh, there's no maybe about it. He definitely will at some point or another unless he returns first. There was a group of missionaries who had gone to the Philippine Islands. And they were strong on the woman's head covering. It's a good thing. It's no problem. But what they had ended up doing is they would go into the churches there in the Philippines. They would organize churches. And when those churches were organized, obviously they taught that the women should observe the covering. And as they did so, once again, no problem with that. It's a blessing. But then they would turn around and they would teach those churches furthermore that if there was another Baptist church that holds to closed communion, that holds to Baptist baptism, that has scriptural authority, if there's another Baptist church that has all of those earmarks as one of the Lord's churches, if the women do not wear the head covering in another church, then they're an unscriptural church and letters cannot be exchanged between those two churches because of the head covering. Beloved, we have no scriptural warrant for such practices. Amen. Absolutely none. And what that ended up doing, at least in the Philippine Islands, is it caused great, great, great division between those churches. Because sometimes, one time, my wife and I had gone to one of those churches like that. And at the time, those women, they would come up and they would say, well, does Providence Baptist Church? And at this time, I did not see it. We didn't practice it. But they came up and said, does Providence Baptist Church, do your women have wear covering? And we said, no, ma'am, they don't. And they said, well, you're an unscriptural church. And I kid you not, those ladies would sit there and stare at my wife with a snarl just about on their face because they felt as though they were so good so righteous, so holy, because they had their head covering on and the ladies of our church did not have one on. Beloved, such things ought not to be so. We do not break fellowship with regards to eschatology. 
One of our brethren that I have preached here in the conference, whenever he is available, he does not agree with us on eschatology. We do not break fellowship over the subject of eschatology. If someone is an amil, we will not break fellowship with them and say you're no longer a church or you're not right with God or you're living in sin. We will not break fellowship with them. In other words, we allow them that Christian liberty. We allow that. We will not break fellowship over those things. And yet, beloved, what we must be on guard against is whenever we come to that place that we begin breaking fellowship, there's a dire and a great danger among Baptists that, beloved, I do not know whether it's root being that of pride or what it is, but there's a great danger among Baptists. And it is a funny riddle, funny rhyme that they will give you, I should say, us four and no more, us three and not me, us two and not you, and then it's just me, me, me. Sometimes as Baptist churches, we will dwindle down, and we will develop that attitude. Now, I'm not saying we have that attitude here at Bryan Station. I do not see it. I do not believe that we have that at all. But I have been in some churches that have that attitude that people say, Oh, you use grape juice in the Lord's Supper. We're not fellowshipping with you. I'll tell you what, you will never, ever, ever stand in my pulpit if you use grape juice in the Lord's Supper. Oh, your women aren't covered. You will never stand in my pulpit then if your women aren't covered. Oh, you don't agree with me on eschatology? Well, then I'll tell you right now, we will never be able to fellowship. And it will come to the point, beloved, if we're not careful that pettiness will seek in, sneak, seek in, seek in, seep in, and it will come to the point that we will have that attitude. Oh, your, your pastor don't wear a tie when he preaches? I'm telling you what, according to the scriptures, preachers ought to have a necktie on when they preach. The Bible does not say men have to wear a necktie when they preach. It just doesn't say it. The Bible doesn't even say you have to wear a jacket when you preach. Now the thing about it is, once again, with regards to all of these things, beloved, and it is an old adage which has been well worn, but we must always seek to major on the majors and minor on the minors. Our purpose in being here is all about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is paramount. We must be faithful to preach the gospel. We must be faithful to teach the scriptures as they're given to us. But we must never come to that point that we begin to minor on the minors, lest we become a church like unto the one out of several states from here that they decided that the church could not come to a consensus on which side of the auditorium that the broom closet was going to be on in the auditorium. One wanted the broom closet on this side, the other ones wanted the coat closet on that side. And it was such a fierce debate, and after so many months, they ended up disbanding because they said, you know what, we're never going to come to an agreement on this. There's not enough of us to continue on, and so therefore we're going to disband because we cannot agree. Beloved, whether there's even one closet in the building, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that we stay faithful to the scriptures, that we preach the gospel, that we preach church truth, and that we observe the ordinances as they have been given to us in the scriptures. Bear these things in mind, beloved. It's not such a problem for us now, but there's always that possibility that in the future, these problems can arise. And as I was sharing with a brother earlier this evening, that old song, beloved, that I've given to you all, that old devil, he is a sly old fox. And if we're not careful, he can take and snare us and cause us to be, get caught up into the things that are not worthy of dividing a church or splitting a church over. And yet, beloved, there are indeed truths. The Bible tells us to contend for the faith, and there is that balance there which must be maintained. And above all else, beloved, love. Maintain that love one for another. Because, you see, if we love one another then we will treat one another as we should. In closing, look with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The Apostle Paul is saying there, if he had the most eloquent speech on the face of the earth, if he does not have love, then he has become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Doeth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoice. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Beloved, with regards to those childish things, it is said that there was a group of children many years ago, and they decided that they were going to start a club. As they sat down to manage what those club rules were going to be, they were having a struggle figuring out what the rules for their club would be. And finally they said, we think we have it all figured out. In our club, nobody's allowed to act too big. They said, that sounds like a good rule. The other rule is nobody's allowed to act too little. And they said, that sounds like a good rule too. That was the rule for their club. You know, we hear of that and we think, oh, that's kind of cute. That's kind of childish. Well, beloved, we as the people of God, we're told to put away childish things. In other words, don't get into arguments over the color of carpet, where the broom closet's going to be. But rather, beloved, acknowledge that love, the Spirit of God, is our governing agent there. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let's